All right, seventh graders, we're gonna actually be skipping around a little bit to cover what we need to cover for statistics. So we're actually gonna only talk about section 4.5, analyzing lines of fit. We're only gonna cover one section from this chapter. And then we're gonna skip ahead to chapter 11 out of the Big Ideas book. So analyzing lines of fit. There's one thing in here that you've already done, and that's positive and negative correlations. When you guys like calculated R values with linear regression models, now you may be a little rusty on that, but we'll go over that and review that again. So what are you going to learn? You're gonna learn how to use residuals to determine how well lines of fit model data. You're gonna use technology to find lines of best fit, and you're gonna distinguish between correlation and causation. This may be difficult for some of you, and that's okay. Just make sure you answer and ask questions in class tomorrow on anything I can help you with. So let's start talking about analyzing residuals. One way to determine how well a line of best fit models a data is to, is to analyze residuals. So what is a residual? A residual is the difference of the Y value of a data point and the corresponding Y value found using the line of best fit. A residual can be positive, negative, or zero. So let's take a look at this line over here. If I was given you, and we've done this before, if you have all these points that do not make a line, but make a correlation, for example, a whole bunch of points on a scatter plot that are increasing, you've already done where you've drawn a line of fit, a line of best fit that goes through that data. And then you've written an equation based on it, either using a calculator or by just picking two points and writing an equation in slope-intercept form or point-slope form. Then the actual value of the point, if it's above the line of best fit, it's a positive residual. If it's below, it's a negative residual. A scatter plot of the residuals shows how well a model fits a data set. If the model is a good fit, then the absolute values, this is important, if it's a good fit, the absolute values of the residuals are relatively small and the residual points will be more or less evenly dispersed about the horizontal axis. If the model is not a good fit, the residual points will form some type of pattern that suggests the data is not linear. Wildly scattered residual points suggest that the data might have no correlation. All right, now before you're completely confused, we're gonna go over an example one, which we're gonna use residuals. I'm thinking this is gonna help you understand what we're doing. So in example three of section 4.4, you don't need to know that anything from that section. So basically, here's what we have. We have an equation. This equation models the data in the table shown. Now, I wanna tell you something, that this right here, this equation, is what you've done before in writing something from a scatter plot. So these points right here, all these points, do not form a line, they form a scatter plot. This right here, the equation, is just something that models it, it's the line of best fit. So we wanna know, is the model a good fit? So here's what you have to do. Step one, we're gonna calculate the residuals. Now you're probably like, uh, I don't even know what that means. Okay, so here's what we're gonna do. In order to calculate residuals, here's what we do. This is just a table that you could draw. So this up here, so let me quickly go over this again. This table is actual values that make a scatter plot. This is a line of best fit. It's our best model. Is it that model a good fit? So here's what we do. If I plug in all of these X values from the model, this is what I get. So I get, for example, if I plug in one here, negative two times one, so 20 minus two is 18. I plug in two, 20 minus four is 16. I plug in three, I plug in four. So all of these are based on the model. However, these are the actual values. So the residual is the difference from the actual ones in the scatter plot to the ones based on the model. So as you can see, we always take this side minus the model. So we take 19 minus 18, which is one. 15 minus 16, which is negative one. 13 minus 14 is negative one. And we continue this pattern. And we graph the residuals. 
So that means this. We take the x value, which is from right here. We plugged in 1. They're the same. And then we graph all the red dots. So we graph the point 1, 1. So here it is. Then we graph the point 2, negative 1. Here it is. 3, negative 1. Here it is. And we continue on. And we want to know, is it a good disbursement? So the points are evenly dispersed about the horizontal axis. So you'll notice here, here's my horizontal axis. I have two points on, three points above, three points below. So yes, it is evenly dispersed about the horizontal, horizontal axis. So the equation, y equals negative 2x plus 20, is a good fit. In example number two, we have another problem, exact same type of problem. Here are the actual values of x and y, which represents age and salary. The equation, 0.2x plus 38, models the data. Is it a good fit? I've done all the work, so you don't have to write it down, but it's the same process. Here's all my x values, right here. Here's all the salaries. This right here is the actual salaries from the scatter plot. This is what happens when I plug my x values into my equation. So I took all of these right here, and I plugged them into my equation, and that goes right here. I then subtracted... 42 minus 45 and got negative 3. 44 mi minus 45.4. And I calculated all the residuals. So now we look and we graph them. Does it form like a linear pattern, kind of like on each side? But remember, the farther away from the x-axis it gets, the more it's not going to suggest that it's, that it's relational. So we look at this. It says the residual points form a U-shaped pattern which suggests the data are not linear. So the equation, y equals 0.2x plus 38, does not model the data. Now this, we don't need to write down because we've already done this, but I'm going to review it again. Lines of best fit. When you have a graphing calculator, you can use a method called linear regression. regression. Linear regression to find a precise line of fit, called the line of best fit. Now, a calculator will give you the value r called the correlation coefficient. Now, looking at this chart, you already know that the closer it is to zero, it's going to be no correlation. The farther to the right, closer to one, it's a strong positive correlation. And stronger to the left, there is a strong negative correlation. Now, you do not need to write any of this down because you've done this before. So here we go. The table shows the durations x in minutes of several eruptions of a geyser old faithful and times y in minutes until the next eruption. Use a graphing calculator to find an equation of a line best fit. Then plot the data and graph the equation in the same viewing window. Identify and interpret the correlation coefficient and interpret the slope and y-intercept of the line of best fit. Now you'll remember, you take your x values and you put them in a list in the first column. You take your y values, you enter them in the second column under the, under, the, under the second list. And then you should remember that you plug it into your calculator, use the linear regression model, and you get this, and where it shows you the slope, the y-intercept, and then the correlation coefficient. So if we wrote something here, we would write the equation y equals it's approximately 12, so 12x plus about 35, or you could do 35.1. Part B said, identify and interpret the correlation coefficient. So B would say the correlation coefficient is approximately 0.979. This means that the relationship between the durations and the times until the next eruption has a strong positive correlation, and the equation closely models the data as shown in the graph. Right here, the slope of the line is 12. What does that mean? Well, all you have to do is look at the equation. Y is in minutes. X is in minutes. Y represents the times until the next eruption. X is um, the duration of the eruption. So you would know that 12 means the time until the next eruption increases about 12 minutes. For each minute, the duration increases. The y-intercept is 35, but it has no meaning in the context because the duration of something cannot be zero minutes. So once again, I'm going to read this again because the slope may have been confusing for you. The table 
if we, let me bring back the table. So the table, x is the duration of minutes, time y is how many minutes until the next eruption. So since 12 over 1, the y value on top, it means for the time until the next eruption increases by about 12 minutes over here. The time until the next eruption increases by 12 minutes for every one minute increase in the duration of the eruption. So that's how you would explain the slope. All right, next, using a graph or its equation to approximate a value between two known values is called interpolation. Using a graph or its equation to predict a value outside the range of known values is called extrapolation. Interpolation is approximating something in which stuff you already know. Extrapolation is predict something past what you don't know, outside of the range of values. So in general, the farther removed a value is from the known values, the less confidence you have in the accuracy of the prediction. So here's what it means. Let me just kind of put it in normal terms. If you are using data for the population of a city, let's say from 2000 to 2008, any approximate value of population within that 2000 to 2008 would be an interpolation. But once you get past 2008, if you don't know what the population is, that's called extrapolation. The farther away from 2008 you get, the less confident you would have in, in predicting something because you don't know what it's actually going to be. So, example number four, interpolating and extrapolating data. Refer to example three, use the equation of the line of best fit, and we want to approximate the duration before a time of 77 minutes and predict the time after an eruption lasting five minutes. So from example three, we know that the equation was y equals 12x plus 35. Well, since the approximate duration before a time of 77 minutes, so that means we want to find x. x represented the duration of minutes, and y represented the time. So our equation would be 77 equals 12x plus 35. Well, that's an easy equation to solve. We subtract 35, divide by 12. The value of x would be 3.5. So in part a, the eruption lasts about three and a half minutes before a time of 77 minutes. So then part B, predict the time after an eruption lasting five minutes. So it says that we could use a graphing calculator to graph the equation and then use the trace feature to find the value of y when x is approximately five. Or we can just take our equation, plug in five, y equals 60 plus 35, which is 95. So that means at a time of 95 minutes, would you have follow an eruption of approximately five minutes long? I'm actually starting this at the bottom. I'm going to move it up, adding more stuff as we go. Now, correlation is the relationship between things. Now, when a change in one variable causes a change in another variable, it's called causation. Causation produces a strong correlation between the two variables. The converse, though, is not true. In other words, correlation does not imply causation. So what that means is just because two things are related does not mean one thing causes the other. So here's what we want to know. Tell whether a correlation is likely in the situation. If so, Tell whether there is a causal relationship. Explain your reasoning. So, first thing, the time spent exercising and the number of calories burned. Well, there is a positive correlation and a causal relationship because the more time you spend exercising, the more calories you burn. Now, B says there may be a positive correlation, and here's why. I want to know if there's any causation or correlation between the number of banks and the population of a city. Now you may say, well, absolutely. The more people, the more banks there's going to be. But here's what it, it gets kind of confusing. 
There may be a positive correlation, but there is absolutely no causal relationship. Building more banks does not mean, because the number of banks is first, what it says is that the number of banks would tell me what the population of a city would be. No, if I built more banks, that does not cause the population to increase of a city. Therefore, there is no causal relationship.